Hi, I'm Terry Markson, the Senior Librarian in the Exploration and Creativity Department of the Los Angeles Public Library. We'd like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring LA Made programs to you virtually. LA Made focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you would like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA Made programs specifically, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. And now on to today's LA Made. We are so pleased to welcome Tony Froha, PhD, who is a wildlife scientist, advocate, author, and TED speaker with Terramar Research. Tony will be discussing cognition, communication, culture, and conservation of dolphins and whales, and about how interdependent and interconnected we all are from land and from sea. Our moderator today is Jessica Merrill, a professional diving instructor, travel blogger, and underwater photographer who has taught scuba diving in locations all over the world, including Indonesia, Jordan, Mexico, Honduras, and others. Welcome, Tony and Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Hey, nice to see you. It's great to see you too. We uh, had the good fortune to meet over lunch and it was so fascinating to hear about some of your adventures. So I really look forward to uh, touching on those when we're, I'm done with my slide presentation. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on today and thanks to Terry as well for the introduction. So um, I might as well go ahead and plunge right in. <laughs> so Steve, if we could start up the slides, that would be fabulous. So the name of my talk, as Terry said, is Interdependence with Our Dolphin and Whale Neighbors. I'm Tony Frohoff and I'm with Terramar Research and we're based in California but our work is international. And uh, if you could please hit the next uh, slide. I just really want to thank LA Made at the Los Angeles Public Library. Um, I myself am LA Made. I grew up and was born in Los Angeles and I have great experiences being supported by the books. Um, I was a book addict growing up. So um, I really uh, am pleased to be doing this presentation for the library in some tiny way, giving back for borrowing billions of books, it felt like, growing up. So let's start with our first uh, oceanic slide. And I wanna just take us to the coastline because when we're at the seashore, it's often, you know, we could, it could be very beautiful, but maybe with the exception of a few birds or whatnot, um, it doesn't nearly represent the beautiful life that is below and within. Next slide, please. And if we're really lucky, we will see some marine mammals because dolphins, whales, and seals and sea lions and such, they are mammals and they have to come up to the air to breathe. So lucky for us, we get to see glimpses of them from time to time. I'm going to start by introducing our dolphin neighbors because even if we don't live on the coast itself, they really are our neighbors and we're sharing a coastal habitat directly or indirectly in ways that I'll get into a little bit. And also our whale neighbors, these are humpback whales. They uh, share the ocean with the dolphins off of California and many other areas around the world. Next. I can't overlook the fact that we have these incredible forests, these kelp forests, sea grasses, obviously coral reefs in the ocean, algae and plants and animals who, that are doing just the most miraculous things under the surface of the water 
And even though our terrestrial land-based forests are so precious and important, it's really uh, comforting and miraculous to know all about the life that is under the sea that is really nurturing us uh, wherever we are, because it's, as I'll go into, it's, it's helping our climate, it's helping our oxygen that we breathe, even if we're in the interior of a large continent, such as the US. Next. So I can't take you all whale watching, so I'm going to just show a quick slide next or a video of what are called common dolphins, who are anything but common. And sometimes you'll see tens, hundreds, thousands. I've seen tens of th thousands of common dolphins as far as the eye can see. And it's something that is has to be experienced, really. It just seeing a clip doesn't help, but that's a start. Next, please. So this slide is from the Condor Express. For some reason, the credit isn't being shown, but um, Adam with the Condor Express was kind enough to share this beautiful footage of a humpback whale with a rainbow in, it just happened to be. And this humpback whale is coming up to the Condor Express whale watching boat in Santa Barbara. And the boat does not try to approach the whales this closely, but sometimes the whales are curious about us and they do. Uh, give us these opportunities. And if we're really lucky, we will see, here we go, this is uh, uh, from Adam as well, a shot of a blue whale, the largest animal who ever existed on the planet, at least as far as we know right now. I shouldn't say ever. Uh, new evidence may prove otherwise, but right now blue whales are the largest and we can see them off the coast of California if we're lucky. Next. And bottlenose dolphins are who you might see if you see dolphins from the coast. Uh, their uh, genus and species is Terciops truncatus. We biologists sometimes just call them Terciops, but they are so much more than their name. Uh, there is an inshore variety, a coastal variety along California and an offshore variety. And uh, basically uh, they really stay close to shore. And there are maybe 600, we're not sure, between Ensenada, Mexico area, as far north as San Francisco and northward. And these uh, dolphins were kind of my gateway into the world of dolphins and whales. Next. So I started out in Los Angeles, studied the dolphins of Santa Monica Bay for a short while, and now a wonderful biologist, Dr. Madalena Bersi is uh, studying them. And now I'm in Santa Barbara uh, with Terramar Research and POD, Protect Our Dolphin Neighbors. And we're trying to fill in the gaps along the California coast because the dolphins who we're seeing in Ensenada, Mexico or San Diego, we'll also see them up in San Francisco. And so it's great to get an idea of who are they with? What are they doing? Um, are they with the same individuals? How fast can they travel? How is their health? Next slide, please. And whenever uh, we can, we go out on the water and we are so fortunate to be able to work with students, some local, some who just come out to uh, volunteer and they don't just help our research, but um, we're giving them skills simultaneously to learn how to really be a good naturalist, how to be a scientist and collect data about the behavior of the dolphins. Next slide, please. And then, um, yeah, oh well, yeah. And we, we really, we, we go for multi-species encounters here. We want observers, and this is our dog, Ami, who is an adept dolphin observer. So we look for the dolphins, and when we see them, next slide please, we will then take pictures and video to document their behavior. But if we look at the next slide, we'll see that we also particularly look at their, what we call the dorsal fin. The, on the back of the dolphin is a dorsal fin on most species of dolphins, definitely bottomless dolphins. Each dorsal fin is like a fingerprint. And yes, it will change as 
the dolphins get older. Sometimes they'll get scars. Sometimes they'll have shark bites or, or rake marks from other dolphins. But it's really wonderful to see how they progress. And then we can compare those slides and identify dolphins in a way similar to that, which uh, when we're looking at the larger whales, we'll look at their whales, their flukes, and each fluke is um, unique as well. Next slide, please. So we put all this together and then we present posters, papers, sometimes students can co-author and uh, we collaborate uh, with other scientists along the coast of California, sometimes even as far north as uh, Washington and Oregon. There are sometimes bottomless dolphins who go there, but we're learning so much about what affects them and not just how we protect them, but how they are indicators of the health of our shared coastal ecosystem. Next slide, please. So I'm going to cover three things today. Who are dolphins and whales? How are we interdependent with them and the marine environment? And can whales help save the world? Which is a teaser question because I'm going to touch on that later. Lastly, what can we do to survive in these intense times and thrive together in such a rapidly changing world? We'll start with who are these dolphins and whales? Next slide, please. And there is a diverse world of cetaceans which encompass dolphins, whales, and porpoise. The odonoceids, there are roughly 70 species of what are considered toothed dolphins and whales. They can include small porpoise to large sperm whales who have teeth. Then there are the mysticetes, the baleen whales, who instead of teeth, filter their food at, with baleen. And uh, so together, that's quite a, an amazing diversity. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So a new era of research is revealing an extraordinary array of cognitive, cultural, communicative, and psychological competencies in cetaceans. Now this alone warrants, um, we could talk for days about this, but I wanna breeze through these slides because we have so much to talk about. But as we'll see in the next slide, we have a number of things in common with dolphins and whales. And if we could see the first point, please. We have surprisingly similar cognitive, social, and psychological capacities and needs. And this is not just because we've obtained this through behavioral uh, observations, but there is ample neurological evidence to document this. Next. Um, Cetaceans have highly sophisticated communicative abilities. Now I'm talking with you using some very high-tech technology, which means we're pretty good at communication too. But they have sonar, they have ways of communicating across great distances and ways of seeing the world and perhaps sharing that information with one another acoustically, visually, in ways that we really can just begin to comprehend. So I would argue and I think some of my colleagues would agree with me that they have some perhaps uh, superior uh, communicative abilities as well. Also, we have remarkably complex and lifelong social bonds in humans and in many, if not all, cetacean uh, groups. And this includes culture and cultural traditions. Also, there are some females that we found in cetacean groups who live well past menopause, leading matriarchal societies and serving as vital repositories of knowledge for current and future generations. And when I spoke with Jessica, who's moderating, I think she said that the future is female in many ways, or at least in many cultures. So we'll look at this a little bit if we have time. Next. Um, so bottlenose dolphins, orcas, and some of the better studied 
species of cetaceans form complex societies with dynamic social roles and intricate social networks, many with cultural traditions, as I said. On the bottom left photo, you'll see what is a bottlenose dolphin in Australian waters with a sponge at the end of his or her rostrum, which is their beak, uh, really their mouth. And they use the sponges as tools. So yes, dolphins use tools. They don't have hands in the way that we do, but they are tool users, at least in a way that to us may seem rudimentary, but they certainly know how to get fish that they want to get with those tools. Orcas in the center picture are perhaps the best known, um, well, also sperm whales, examples of culture in cetaceans. Uh, we could talk forever about the amazing ways in which they have different cultures. Uh, some feed only on fish. Some feed really mostly on other marine mammals. Uh, they have Dialects, people who study orcas can literally tell sometimes which pod an orca is from, not by seeing the orca, but just from listening to the dialect. It's like an accent. Uh, there are so many behavioral uh, uh, ways in which cultural traditions identify different uh, groups of orca whales. And everybody has probably heard of the song of the humpback whale that is also an aspect of vocal culture. Next slide, please. We might have a video of sonar. Uh, actually, it's more the acoustics of sonar, which is echolocation and it's vision through sound. It's one of the ways that dolphins see the world. So Steve, if we could try this next video, please, and see if we can hear it, that would be great. So I'm going to ask Steve to play that again because often when I share that, and thank you to um, uh, to Terramar Productions and to uh, the Dolphin Project for that video, uh, we really, um, it, this is what it's like if you're in the water, which I don't encourage everybody to try to be in the water with dolphins, but if you're in the water, sometimes you don't only hear that sound, but you can feel it in your body. And what they're getting is the sound received back to them in a way that they can sense a picture. So let's try that one more time. So that was a simulation of being echolocated by a dolphin. So next slide, please. When it comes to studying these incredible animals' facts really are more fascinating than the fables. And we also really need to respect what happens when these incredible opportunities occur. You're looking at a picture of Luna, who was an orca. If you could please go back to Luna, uh, who's an orca right there at the dock, who is um, separated from his family, or he was, and he, basically formed connections with a human community up in British Columbia. And so what we have is, um, there's a whole movie called The Whale. You can go to Saving Luna. Um, but basically uh, he befriended a community and uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. That was an example of, of the cetacean interest in humans. Um, another example is the occurrence of gray whales in Baja Lagoons in Mexico, uh, where they mate and breed and nurse their young. And even though they were almost uh, hunted to extinction, somehow the population came back. So first of all, we have a great conservation story for, you know, we, we cling to these. But on top of it, these whales actually will come to the boats and elicit uh, eye contact and sometimes even human touch. And again, these are, this is only under the most careful of conditions, but it's really remarkable 
that especially after that type of history, we have this type of reconciliation. Next. And this curiosity that some dolphins and whales have uh, expressed towards humans, it's great. And at the same time, it can be really tough to be a researcher and try to be invisible, whether we're on a boat or underwater. Of course, we can't be invisible. But um, even if we try to be really boring on the boat, you'll see that Beluga Q investigates the research boat. And then Beluga, who we named Q, um, makes eye contact. So we can try to pretend we're just being objective scientists, which we really are as much as, as humanly possible, but we really are interacting, not just with an animal, but with another being. And we can't avoid that. So yes, you'll see later, we try to actually use that to our advantage in some of our interactive um, observations, because whether or not we like it or not, they will make it interactive. Next slide, please. And again, uh, not every dolphin is curious about humans. And I wanna emphasize that because I don't want people to go out in their boats or whatnot and expect dolphins to just be curious about us because they're not always, uh, they have to catch food and, and take care of their young and they have their work to survive just like we do. But once in a while, we, I think that they're studying us almost as much as we're studying them. And in this process, I wanna go into the next step of who dolphins are. We really have to have a willingness to listen. And the more we learn about them, the more we realize that this is the next step in this, uh, what might be called uh, evolution of learning about cetaceans, elephants, other species, even octopus. Some of you might've seen my octopus teacher. Uh, these are sentient beings and Let's go to the next slide, please. We really have to be willing to not just be animal whisperers, but animal listeners. And this dolphin Mara in Ireland uh, is a dolphin who I didn't expect to meet. And uh, she's uh, a dolphin who is sometimes with other dolphins of her own kind. And sometimes she interacts with humans. And so um, if you go to the next slide, um, I will also show you that she's not always just interested in us. Sometimes dolphins will be more interested in their canine companions than humans. So if we think we're all that, we're not really just the pinnacle of, of an animal species necessarily, at least not to dolphins. Next. I want to touch on something really cool called interspecies fishing cooperatives or interspecies collaborative fishing. In a remote area of Brazil, uh, well, I don't know how remote it is now, Laguna, uh, uh, traditional fishermen for generations have caught fish collaboratively with certain dolphins who actually have their own vocal dialect as well. And this has happened for multiple generations of fishermen and their families, as well as multiple generations of dolphins. We have similar lifespans. So it's fascinating. And this is not the only area of the world. There's some documentation of this happening with Aboriginal people in Australia and other parts of the world. But literally, they will help each other find prey. And it's not because we're training them to. If anything, they sometimes train humans to do this. Next. So I want to talk about how are we interdependent with dolphins and whales, which is really the core of why we're here today and, uh, and the marine environment. When I showed you bottlenose dolphins, uh, I want to just remind us, remind myself how closely we live with them, even if we don't always see them, everything we do affects them. And when we have a fire, the smoke from the fire, we know that's really uncomfortable um, that for us to breathe, they have to breathe that as well. And so we really live in close, close uh, proximity. I just received a message saying, please add a comment that people should email ECDEPT 
at lapl.org to enter a drawing to win a copy of my book. Okay, so uh, that might be put on the screen. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the darker side of dolphins having to live in such close proximity to humans because with our reliance on industrialization uh, comes a heavy price to pay. And one of the things that we're doing when we're uh, identifying dolphins and documenting their behavior and their health is we're looking at conditions of their skin because that's a parameter of their, if they're immunocompromised or um, various if they're under stress. So uh, sometimes dolphins do have skin lesions and uh, other dermal uh, afflictions. So we really need to keep an eye on these things and ideally mediate them whenever possible. Next, please. So this is not a video, but a screenshot of um, a recent news article. Some of you might have heard of the what's called a mysterious sea lion cancer linked to DDT and other toxic chemicals in the environment. Okay, let's go. And so to this, uh, people in Los Angeles have probably heard, and I don't know who's watching right now, um, but there has been a massive um, DDT dumping ground found off the Los Angeles coast. And there are these barrels of DDT. Next slide, please. Um, thousands of them. And if you look at the map, you'll see that um, it's between somewhat Catalina Island and Palos Verdes Peninsula. Next slide, please. So that's an example of how what we're doing is affecting them and what is happening to them is affecting us. And here we see that um, the microplastic invasion is taking a toll. Um, not just those of us on the coast and not even just people who eat fish, but people are eating the same fish sometimes that dolphins and other cetaceans are eating. And there's plastic in that fish. There are plastic particles in the air we're breathing. That's in land and sea. And we're sharing that air with them. So even if we're in Kansas or Colorado, what's happening out at sea is affecting all of us inland as well. Next slide. And I don't have to tell some of you that it is hot out there. So um, that's affecting our, obviously, climate crisis is affecting the ocean as well. And it's getting hotter. And we need more whales to help cool the earth. And that is in reference to my earlier question where I said, can whales help save the planet? Well, not alone, but they are much more important than we ever even thought just to our own survival. Obviously they have their own inherent worth unto themselves, but we found that the world's largest animals are unusually good at taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Next slide, please. So um, I'll explain how to fight climate change, the Save the Whales movement may actually help us in that direction. Next. So I'm not going to go through the details of this slide, but I wanna point out that the way that whales feed, the way they poo, the way they migrate and dive between the surface and the ocean depths circulates essential nutrients throughout the ocean. And this is what's sometimes referred to as a whale pump. This fertilizes the ocean, fostering the growth of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are very small plants, which lock in massive amounts of carbon from the atmosphere. And even in depth, whales carry the tons of carbon that are stored in their bodies because we are all carbon-based beings. But instead of dying on land and releasing the carbon after their passing, they take it down to usually to the depths of the ocean where the carbon is sequestered and remains for centuries. Next slide, please. So every breath we take is in a sense related to the ocean. 
and we can thank whales and other ocean creatures as well as nature on land for that. And whales have been equated by some scientists to be like giant swimming trees when it comes to carbon sequestration. And we do need more whales in the ocean to help control uh, the impact of the climate crisis. The more whales there are, the healthier the oceans will be and the less carbon there will be in the atmosphere. And this, in this I note that there have been um, so many male, so, so many whales who have been killed in uh, commercial whaling over the last few centuries. There would be a lot more now. Um, and so hopefully we can really uh, contribute to their well-being, if not for their sake, for ours. Next slide. And I have to give another nod to how kelp combats climate change and coral and seagrass and all of these other uh, very unique uh, ecosystem uh, supporters. Next slide. Lastly, what can we do to survive and thrive together in this rapidly changing world? Next slide, please, Steve. Thank you. First, I want to just address the fact that in these post-colonial times, there has been generally a consensual trance that we are separate from nature. And this post-colonial culture has normalized taking from nature and rather than being reciprocal, and we need to give back. And if we have a more reciprocal relationship that acknowledges our interdependence, it'll be a healthier environment for us all. Next. And to this point, uh, I can't uh, emphasize enough how important indigenous peoples around the world, how their contributions have been far too overlooked and even in these modern times where things are so different, um, we really need to pay more attention to uh, what they have to say and science is supporting so much of what they said. Next. We need to dispel the myth of human exceptionalism. And in that, it's not just a philosophical position of mine, but it's biologically incorrect to say that humans are more ecologically or um, evolutionarily advanced than other animals. We're not, we've been around a few hundred thousand years. This orca, we're talking about million in the millions of years. Next slide, please. This is a photo of a captive swim program where the dolphins look like they're smiling, but the smile is fixed. It's a not a facial expression. So. Uh, Please advance this. So this is an example of how we could really do well to transcend existing models of disrespect, dominion, captivity, commodification, and coercion over other animals and nature. Next. And this is just an example, again, of what we can transcend. Next slide, please. So we can go from looking at other aspects of nature as resources to exploit and see them in a way that's respectful. Next. This New Yorker cover was from 2010 when there was a Gulf oil spill. Some of you may remember that. And if we could let other animals and nature be more of the judge and jury of our actions and be more accountable, uh, Think, then things would certainly be different. Next. Just to point out that what we're engaged in is academia, but also academic advocacy. Next. And uh, with Dr. Lori Marino, who's a noted uh, neurobiologist, we uh, wrote some papers on interspecies collaborative research. And it's basically going from this in captivity to this and the bottom right, which is we're observing dolphins on their terms where they can actually be dolphins. Next slide, please. 
And then we go from relationships of dominance and objectification, replace those with relationships of respect and collaboration. Next. We can become more ecocentric rather than egocentric or human centric and share the beach with seals and share our, what we think is our lands with other animals and plants who really, and obviously peoples um, who originally had, uh, have um, lived in these areas. Next slide, please. We can have more marine protected areas. I'm going to pass through this map, but uh, marine protected areas are important and we have those and we need more of them. We can take more children, even so many kids who live along the coast have not seen the dolphins and whales and other seabirds and other creatures in their own backyard. Okay. And we can reduce plastics. Dr. Bearsey, who I mentioned in LA, is with the Ocean Conservation Society, and they're reducing plastics. They have a project to deflate our dependence on balloons. Next slide, please. And Sylvia Earle, my uh, one of my my great mentors and and uh, idols, she talks about how eating. She doesn't see fish as seafood. She sees them as wild animals first. And she, um, this is important. What's on our plate makes much more of a difference than we would ever see. So who is on our plate and what is on our plate? It's a huge personal decision that we can make every day. Next slide. So as I wind up this part of the talk, I wanna say that we're looking at more than species. We're looking at individuals and cultures. And this is not just in the ocean. When we're looking at crows outside and ravens, they have culture. It's such a, a rich, a rich um, and sophisticated world of other beings. Next slide. Steve, next slide, thank you. And when we're saving the whales, we're also saving ourselves. Next slide. The Friendship Fountain that you see here is in Santa Barbara. And if you don't mind zooming in on that, when the Chumash, the uh, indigenous peoples of this area, they, when they perform their sacred dolphin dance at the dedication of Santa Barbara's Friendship Fountain in 1985, scores of dolphins appeared offshore near the harbor and this is not an area where we typically see dolphins. So you can go to the next slide, but I, again, we really cannot discount the interdependence that we, if we don't acknowledge that we have it, we need to now. We have such a deep need to acknowledge the interdependence that is interspecies, intercultural, and intergenerational. Next. So, in doing this, we're redefining we. Next slide, please. In conclusion, I really wanna thank the Los Angeles Public Library and the other people and groups listed here. And I really want to, again, thank the First Nations people, uh, especially those whose land I'm on now, the Neutral North who, uh, have worked with Luna, the Orca you saw, Shumash First Peoples, and all the others. Next slide, please. If you want to reach me, I'm at terramarresearch.org. If you want to reach Dr. Madalena Bersi in Los Angeles, uh, you've got oceanconservation.org. And of course, and internationally, the esteemed National Geographic Explorer. Uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle at Mission Blue, who's doing the most amazing work. Thank you all. Now I guess we'll continue to some conversation. Jessica. Hey. <laughs> hey there. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, that was awesome. 
And before we jump into our chat, I just want to take a second to acknowledge uh, we've got some viewers who are already dropping some questions for us in the comments section. So you guys, we haven't forgotten about you. In just a few minutes, we're going to get back on here and answer some of those questions. Uh, and actually, some of you are asking questions that I would like to hear answered as well. So we'll see you guys in just a second. <laughs> Tony, you ready to chat? Definitely. Me too. So throughout our conversations uh, before and during this presentation, there are some things that popped into my mind. And I'm imagining a lot of people joined us today because they love whales and dolphins and want to know more about them and how to get involved. But before we jump into that, I'm hoping to hear a bit about your personal experiences and maybe if there was some special turning point or specific interaction during your career uh, or even just a moment that showed you that this was your life's work. And maybe if there is some advice you'd like to offer to anyone who's watching today that's interested in getting involved in cetacean research or helping marine mammals. Uh, thanks for those questions, Jess. I'm gonna answer your last question first because I mentioned a lot of women in science and um, that that's not as common uh, to see women in science in, in many fields, but it's it, within science and medicine, but that's increasing rapidly. So I really wanna encourage women, um, uh, people of color, people who normally have been overlooked um, or didn't think they had an opportunity to get into these fields. Um, if this is a passion, you know, I feel very privileged that I had these opportunities to, to go to school and such. And at the same time, I did work really hard. So I think that if somebody's really, um, could, we need to have more representation in this field because not just because of social justice issues, but because it will make the field better. We need to have diversity in scientists and, and others who are, who are doing such important work in the world. Um, so um, in terms of my personal experience, you know, I was, I've always loved animals. I'd be happy studying wolves and, and elephants, which I do on occasion, but um, I think the concept of communicating with dolphins really blew me away when I saw it on a television show. And then I remember being a teenager trying to learn how to surf and the dolphins kept distracting me. So I became a dolphin scientist, but I never learned how to surf. <laughs> That's an amazing story. I'm a surfer too, and I've had some incredible encounters up close and personal with dolphins. I think it's amazing that so many of us have the opportunity to go into their environment and interact with them. I'm also wondering, uh, since you started working with whales and dolphins, how your opinions of them have grown or changed? And if you feel like we're still learning enough about these animals that we'll keep evolving in our understanding of them uh, or what's left to find out? There's so much left to find out. Uh, we can, um, we always underestimate other animals, even domestic animals. And then that's what I talked about with this myth of human exceptionalism. For some reason, people seem to, um, you know, I grew up with this separation of humans and other animals. And it's amazing that when we look at the, the detailed lives, not just the neuroanatomy and, 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 uh, and the more, um, cognitive aspects of these animals, but the ways that they grieve and experience joy and, and, and their capacities to, to have fear and, and express pleasure. Um, we really are in a new adventure of learning about other species. And that's helping us to not just learn about ourselves, but how we can be better humans. And so to expand on that concept or subject of exceptionalism amongst humans, throughout your presentation and a lot of our conversations, I've noticed that you always refer to dolphins and whales as he or she uh, or they and them, but never it. 
And I've also noticed that you use words like living beings instead of living things. I'm curious to hear a bit more about how we're assigning personhood to these incredible animals. That's a great question, Jess. And I know we're short on time, so I'll keep the answer brief, except to say that it's, in my opinion, it's biologically incorrect to refer to a living being as a thing or an it, especially uh, when there is gender and especially when the gender is known. So if I'm going to speak about um, a dolphin or a whale, especially an animal who's been found to be sentient, for me to say it, just it, it's, it's biologically incorrect. It's not an inanimate object. And Jane Goodall really helped because she was one of the first, if not the first, to ascribe real names to the chimpanzee she was studying. And she spoke about them. She ascribed personage to them in pronouns. And in fact, one of our books, we were able to do that with dolphins because we said, well, Jane Goodall did it. So yes, we're learning. And so viewing these animals as individuals, uh, unique people, just like you and I, how individual are their personalities? Uh, can we identify them by personality? Are there you know, in-depth emotions like fear and pain happening? Uh, are there dolphins with difficult personalities? I think you used the term difficult dolphins when we were <laughs> are there difficult dolphins in our conversation earlier. And and um, there I would say there might be troubled dolphins, um, definitely, especially if they've been traumatized by captivity or you know, capture or, or something like that. But Absolutely. In fact, my uh, co-author on Dolphin Mysteries, uh, Dr. Kathleen Dodinsky, she, she calls them dolphinalities. And it, if we look at a group of dolphins, we, they, they might just look like a group of dolphins, but to them, each one is just as different, I would say, as you and I are. And even if we looked very similar, we both have wavy hair, you know, it just, but we're, we're, we have such a different history and such different uh, temperaments and cognitive capacities. And absolutely, in terms of emotion, when you look at the neuroanatomy of uh, dolphins, whales, and a lot of other species, they have the capacity and they have demonstrated an incredible ability to experience the similar, if not the same emotions that we do. In fact, the emotional parts of the brain for dolphins, for example, including orcas, since they are one of the members of the dolphin family, those parts of the brain that have emotion are highly evolved and developed in cetaceans. Hey guys. <laughs> hey Terry. Happy to be back. And um, again, I wanna remind our viewers that if you would like to be entered into a drawing to win a copy of Tony's book, Dolphin Mysteries, um, please email us at ECDEPT, DC department at LAPL.org. And we have gotten quite a few questions. And so if you don't mind, I'm gonna start going through those. First one is, are whales or other marine animals bothered by the sound of whale watching boats? And I, I know you you both go out on boats to, <laughs> to see to, into the ocean. So um, there's Absolutely. a question. Um, Jess, you might have something to add to this. Um, acoustic uh, pollution is a real problem. Um, in fact, the sound, uh, so boats and industrial activity in the ocean is a very serious problem. In fact, you might have heard some of the problems with people's sonar and other issues. So it's a huge topic, but yes, it's very important for, especially whale watching boats to be very mindful of that and not add extra boats or um, to be very mindful of what engines they're using and things like that. Okay. Um, and uh, since you were talking about women in science and uh, involving kids, um, Cynthia Dorado asks, says, my daughter is asking how old do you have to be to help with whale and dolphin research? I'm sure a lot of kids would like to know that. That's a great question. Um, it's so exciting to have kids help with research. And uh, one of the things that we did a while back 
um, and we might do again, for example, is Dolphin Watch Day, where people can go along the shore and look for dolphins. Now we have cell phones that can take photos. So, um, you know, please contact me um, if, if, you know, you're in my area or I can try to connect people to different projects involving kids where you can help with dolphin and well research, even for sure. Oh, fun. That's a kind of citizen science. <laughs> Absolutely. Community science is increasingly important and feasible. Okay. Diego Lopez asks, what can be done about the toxic waste barrels off the coast of Catalina Island? Is there anyone being held accountable for those waste barrels? Oh, gosh, uh, Diego, that's such an important question. I am, there is a company um, that is been identified as being responsible for the barrels. There are different uh, methods that are being used to pick that up. I can't speak yet, um, concisely to that to that point. It's not my area of expertise. Just have anything to say about that? Okay. Um, I think I we're gonna say that 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 people are working on it very very earnestly, and um, I specialize in in behavior and it's just it's not something i'm working on directly but thank you for the question okay um isabella would like to know what sunblocks are okay to wear in the ocean and i i never thought about sunblocks as perhaps being unfriendly to marine life but it makes sense absolutely well um just you might be able to answer this one sure um i would just say anyone who's interested in using reef safe products. So those are going to be products that aren't harming marine wildlife or the coral reef ecosystem should have a look at savethereef.org. That's where you can find not only an approved brand list, but the individual ingredients. I also want to say that it's important to avoid greenwashed products that may say things like ocean safe, when instead you should be looking for a product that's labeled reef safe. Thank you. Interesting. Okay. Um, here's someone, S. Burroughs, saying, I am interested in a marine aquatic biology undergrad degree, but I'm not great at chemistry. Are there other career paths I could consider? Would love to work with whales. Thanks for this presentation. <laughs> I'm not great at chemistry either. So that's why I specialize <laughs> in marine mammal behavior and also uh, terrestrial mammal behavior. So don't give up. There are so many different uh, ways in which um, people who excel in different ways of thinking and contributing, um, we need all of these people to come together and, and study the environment and the animals and plants together. Um, another question from Diego, does sonar from ships and submarines lead to beached dolphins and whales? An Absolutely. Question. Yes, it, 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 it's not responsible for every incident. Definitely, there, there have been beach dolphins and whales for millennia. But uh, absolutely, we need to be a lot more responsive uh, to the sound in the ocean. I know the organization NRPC has been doing a lot of really good work uh, on minimizing sound. There are local projects, regional in California, and international projects to, to help mitigate that. Okay. Um, that's all the questions that have come in here. I don't know if you guys had a, a few more, um, a I few more a things. <laughs> Can I ask Jess a question? Uh, Jess, I was just wondering, unless you had something you wanted to say otherwise, I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of something that you were talking about when we were fortunate to uh, talk the other day about your own experiences. Yeah, I think you and I were having an awesome conversation about the recent push for people to stop eating seafood and to make some personal changes in their life and where that meets with the needs of local residents and these subsistence communities who oftentimes rely on the ocean. And I think that we see a lot of that happening in places like Baja California and elsewhere in the world, uh, where humans and animals are pushed further into each other's worlds with or without their permission, with or without their consent. 
So while it might seem easy to say everyone stop eating fish today, uh, it kind of overlooks our position of privilege that you and I can choose what we eat, whereas people in remote regions may rely on the ocean not only for their livelihood or their income, but also as a source of sustenance. And that's certainly something that I observed in Baja California in areas like Bahia de Los Angeles, where there's this powerful fight to save the vaquita porpoise. And at the same time, we have to look inside of ourselves to find compassion for those who rely on the ocean for everyday survival, to feed their families, uh, to sustain themselves. And I think that we can also see this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, in land-based situations, uh, for example, the elephants in Sri Lanka, where you know farmers and elephants are pushed further and further into the same territory, uh, and both are struggling to survive. So beautifully said, because we have marginalized farmers in that situation and marginalized elephants. And then you've got the big, the big corporate powers or, or governments that are necessarily not just, um, sometimes just not supporting them, if anything, just taking away what little they both have, so they're forced to compete. And it really brings up the question, we've been through such a brutal time with the pandemic and, and so many just having to really encounter what harms have been done environmentally and to um, other people, people who are neighbors and all around the world. And if we could come through this with a better new normal, um, this is the type of opportunity I, I hope we take advantage of. There's one last question <laughs> that we're gonna take, and that is, um, how many dolphin dialects have been discovered? Oh, that's such a great question. I wish I could answer it. Um, I don't know um, that we've had a chance to even come close to discovering them all. Uh, the, the folks who specialize in orcas, they have identified a lot, but there are orcas in so many parts of the world. We haven't even literally come close to touching the surface. Okay, well, I need to thank you both so much for doing this. Um, it's been such an honor to have you, Tony and Jess. This has been really fascinating. The conversation's fascinating and so timely, um, particularly given um, climate change and your respect for the ocean and its creatures and and also the way humans interact with, with, with um, our neighbors in the ocean. So I want to thank you again, and um, just some housekeeping at the end here. <laughs> and and um, don't forget, you can um, uh, we'll put up the contacts for for Tony. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today for today's Alley Maid program. Remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org/events. Next week we have another wonderful program coming up on Thursday, July 22nd at four with Vanya Mion Kuhn. She will be walking you through a simple yet colorful meal that is packed with fresh produce and greens from the garden that may be enjoyed by the whole family any time of day. Eating should be fun. And if most of us eat with our eyes, then why not make it beautiful? Also, it's not too late to join our summer reading challenge. We hope you will collect points for reading and completing fun learning-based activities and be entered to uh, uh, be entered into our grand prize drawing. You could win a hydroponic arrow garden for your home. It's a great prize. <laughs> Go to lapl.org slash summer for more information and to register. And if you're looking for something fun, we were talking about community science, citizen science, citizen science. Um, if you're looking for something fun that will get you and your family outside exploring nature around your home and your neighborhood, join the LA BioBlitz Challenge. We need your help to photograph and share your observations of wild species of animals, plants, and insects using an app called iNaturalist. Your participation will support our city's effort in protecting wildlife and their habitats. And you can begin today by going to LAPL dot org slash bioblitz and pick up or pick up a bioblitz game board at any of our open branches. 
And that's it for this week. We truly appreciate yourself. Thank you so much again to Tony Frohoff and Jessica Merrill for being our guests today. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.